Well, hello, and welcome back to The Lifestyle Diet. I'm Dr. James Kreider, and today we're going to be talking about the omega acids. Most of my patients have heard of omega-3. Quite a few of them have heard of omega-6, but very few of them really know what it means when we say omega fatty acids and what the importance of them are and what the different roles are. This is what we're going to talk about today. So, the omegas are a fatty acid. You have monounsaturated fatty acids with one bond compared to your saturated fatty acid, which is nothing but carbons and single bonds and hydrogens connected to it. The mono eliminates a couple of the hydrogens, making a bond between the carbons. So you have two bonds holding it together, a double bond. It changes the shape slightly. Then you have poly, poly meaning many. So we have more than one, in this case, three saturated or double bonds. This would make a very unique shape to it, and they can change in three dimensions, of course. So why is it called omega-3? Well, it's one, two, three carbons. The very first double bond is three carbons from the end or the methyl group. So it's omega-3. Omega-6 is, well, six carbons away from the methyl group. So it's omega-6. And that's all there is to it. There's nothing else fancy about omega-3 and omega-6. It's just where does that very first double bond occur? So these two, the omega-3s and the omega-6s, are what we call essential fatty acids. Our body cannot make it. We need to get them from the diet. These are the only two, omega-3, omega-6, and it's the linoleic acid and alpha-linolenic acid. These are N3, N6, and they must come from our diet. Where do we get them? The parents, the linoleic acid, the alpha-linolenic acid, both come from plants. That's where they come from. So vegetable oils, nuts, seeds is where we're going to be getting predominantly the omega-6s. There are animal sources of the compounds that are made further down the line, and we get those from red meat, poultry, eggs, dairy products will make the omega-6s. On the other hand, the omega-3s, again, coming from plant, primarily green grassy plants is where we can get it. And the marine, the fish, the marine sources make the EPA and the DHA, which we all know and which we all try and buy down at the health food store and is a multi-billion dollar business. So linoleic acid. In the beginning 1900s, the predominant form of fat that we used was a saturated fat. It came from animals. Lard, tallow, butter, fatty creams. We had very little vegetable oil consumption. Maybe 0.7 kilograms per person. That was about it in the 1900s. 1999, we saw a big increase. By that time, we were having 14.7 kilograms per person per year. Why is that? Well, Ansel Keys in the 1950s did what he called the seven country study. He looked at the countries around the Mediterranean region and compared them to other countries in the more northern latitudes of Europe. As we went more north, there was a higher consumption of saturated fat, and the higher saturated fat was associated with increased heart disease. So he speculated that if he can get rid of the saturated fat, and make it more polyunsaturated fat, as we see in vegetable oils, that you could reduce the amount of heart disease. Well, that's what happened. That's why we went in 1999 all the way up to 14.7 as we increased our uses of oils to bring in polyunsaturated fats. Did it work as he expected? Well, it's conflicting. Some studies show that by getting rid of the saturated fat, we have improved our heart disease. Other studies don't show that. It's a much more complicated answer than what we first suspected. So the linoleic acid, the agricultural, the industrial revolutions, we started making more of the oils, we planted more grains, and grains are a very good source of omega-6, not so good of the omega-3s, which we find more in grasses. We domesticated the livestock. We put them into the barns, we trapped them, we fed them grains, instead of their natural diet of grass. And because of that, their bodies switch from being primarily omega-3 to primarily 
omega-6. And the dominant form in the animal is arachidonic acid. Linoleic acid in the blue zones represent less than 2% of their dietary intake of calories. Remember the blue zones, we talked about that. We had a video on that. And in these blue zones, these are areas where the people live extraordinarily long. We have a large number of people living into their hundreds and longer. They have very low heart disease, very low risk of diabetes. Most of their chronic disease is eliminated. Well, their diet is 2% of the omega-6. Our diet increased to 6% of our total calories are coming from the omega-6, the linoleic acid. Alpha linoleic, linolenic acid, again, is plant-based. That's where we're going to get it, but a little bit different. I'm sure most of you are already using flaxseed, chia, hemp seed. We see it all the time. People are putting in their yogurts, they're putting in their cereal, they're making it in smoothies, doesn't matter. Canola oil, which again from the blue zones, we talked about Sweden and their makeover. Well, canola oil was invented there and is very rich in monounsaturated fatty acids, but it has AOA. The biologically active forms, as we mentioned, are arachidonic acid for the N6, EPA and DHA for the omega-3s. And where do they come from? They're coming mainly from meat, eggs, some fish, cheese, whereas the EPA and DHA is coming primarily from fish and marine sourced animals. Can't we just make it, you'd say? If we're getting it from the plants, can't we just make it? Well, we can make it. But unfortunately, it's a very inefficient process. The conversion of ALA to EPA and DHA is very low. It's higher in women than in men. In men, we get maybe 4%. It's usually 0 to 4%, probably closer to 1% of the ALA is converted to EPA and DHA. Whereas in women, it goes much higher, double, up to 8%, 9% of the DHA. And that's mainly because of the estrogen. The baby, the fetus growing inside the women, require DHA in the brain. It's a very important part of brain and eye structure. So women with estrogen, as they get pregnant, estrogen levels go up and they make more. And in general, because of the estrogen, they do convert more of the ALA into DHA and EPA than men. Vegetarians, their diet is primarily ALA, and they have very little EPA and DHA in their body. They have to supplement it in order to get it. And we'll talk about supplements. So, arachidonic acid, ARA. Again, we make it from linoleic acid, but extremely inefficient. About 0.3 to 0.6%, if we're lucky, at the most, is converted from the parent linoleic acid but we do get arachidonic acid in our diet, primarily from meat, eggs, poultry, fish, cheese. These are the sources in our diet of arachidonic acid. It has a rate limiting step, delta-6, delta-5, desaturase, don't worry about what they do, and it works competitively with the omega-3s. They both go to the same enzymes, so if you have more of one, less of the other gets converted, vice versa. Arachidonic food sources, as we mentioned, mainly from the diet and mainly from animals. The percent in America, meat and poultry is about 43% of the arachidonic acid. Eggs represent about 19%. Nuts, fish, and other sources. The gamma linoleic acid also is a delta-6. It's a omega-6. However, it doesn't have this rate limiting step right here. So we're able to make a little bit more of the GLA. Not a tremendous because we are still limited up here, but we do make a little bit more of that one. And it's good because the byproducts, the end products from GLA are actually good for the body. Whereas the end products from arachidonic acid are not necessarily good for the body. So. The essential fatty acid pathways, omega-6, linoleic acid, which we get from soybean, corn flour, corn, canola, should be sunflower, another misspell, 
rice and barn oil. The body converts that over to gamma linoleic acid, which then becomes arachidonic acid. Whereas the omega-3 side come down to EPA. EPA can inhibit this conversion and then down to DHA. Very simple. Two parents and the children. Conjugated linoleic acid, a little bit different. The, this is coming from bacteria. Ruminant animals, like the cow, they eat grass, bacteria inside the stomach converts it into CLA. And what's interesting is that CLA is actually a trans fat, and we all know that trans fats aren't good for us. Different in this case, it actually is a heart healthy fatty acid, it's okay. Uh, we don't get a whole lot of it in, in the food. It's primarily in milk products. And you'll see the Dairy Association trying to increase the amount of CLA made in there. How is it increased? Well, grass-fed. Because if you don't have grass, the bacteria have nothing to work on. It doesn't work with the grains. So the grain-fed animals cannot make CLA. It, it takes the grass for the bacteria to convert into CLA. And so in summary, we have LA and ALA, which are the parents, the parent amino acids, and we can get the metabolites in the diet, but at a very low amount. And the conversion factor of LA and ALA going to the metabolites is also very inefficient, very low amount. So what do they do, LA and ALA? Just the parents, that's all we're gonna look at. They're a primary source of our membranes lining the cells. It's that little fatty bag that holds everything else inside of it. And depending on this band, which is created from that double bond that we talked about, that band helps make that membrane a little bit more fluid. Sort of like solid saturated fat, lard, butter at room temperature. And then you get an oil and it's a little bit more liquidy. Well, that's what these bends do, is that it makes our membrane a little bit more fluid, so things can function better. And in the membrane, there's all sorts of little passages for potassium chloride, sodium, etc. that go in and out. And there's enzymes on there which have different functions in the body. These help regulate these functions in the membrane. We also know that if we have a deficiency, we can see some rashes, different skin lesions from that fatty acid deficiency. So, Biologically, N6, N3, they're the biological activity, depends on the active forms, which is the arachidonic acid, EPA, DHA. And the parent forms are only involved really with the membranes and as a source of energy to be digested. We really learned about the importance of these fatty acids when we did the lion heart study. They took a Mediterranean diet, which we already know is the healthiest diet we can have, they took the Mediterranean diet and they added ALA to it. And they compared it to another very good diet at the time that got rid of saturated fats, the National Cholesterol Education Program. Guess what? The Mediterranean diet with LA, ALA had a 65% reduction in the cause of death. Very significant and very encouraging. We also learned in 1982, there was a six-year-old girl that had been shot, lost part of her intestines, and she was put on external feeding, so to speak, a nice IV, which would give her everything that she supposedly needed. Well, within a few months of it, we noticed that she had numbness, paresthesias, weakness, an inability to walk, pain in the legs, and blurring in the vision. They switched her diet to more of a soy base, which was rich in ALA. And within a matter of days, all her symptoms were gone, which showed that we had a need for the ALA in the diet. It was an essential fatty acid. And we started learning about this importance at that point. So the omega-3s, the parent, ALA, as we've talked about, is really a source of energy. The body burns it, and it's in the cell membranes doesn't do much else. The EPA is involved with cutting down 
It's anti-inflammatory. It reduces the inflammatory status of the body, as does DHA. And it's involved in cardiovascular function. We know that it can help prevent and reverse heart disease. DHA is extremely important, not only as an anti-inflammatory, but also in the brain and in the eye, the retina of the eye. Cardiovascular deaths, 55,000 of these a year. It helps prevent cardiovascular deaths. Brain health, as we mentioned, ADHD, eye health, prenatal health, all these things are important benefits from the N3s. Heart disease, mental health, actually helps with weight loss. It helps reduce the fat in the liver, infant brain development, extremely important, inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, dementia, bone health, asthma, other chronic diseases. These are the many roles of omega-3s in the body. Well, we, we all know EPA and DHA for heart disease, but look at the Eskimos. The Greenland Eskimos consume a large amount of fish all the time, and they have virtually no heart disease at all. In fact, the US FDA even states that EPA and DHA may reduce the risk of coronary artery disease. EPA and DHA, as far as heart disease, it reduces an arrhythmia, which is a major cause of sudden death, is that there's a nerve that goes from the upper part of the heart to the lower part of the heart, and it can start misfiring. These essential fatty acids actually help prevent that misfiring. They get into the way the nerve functions. It reduces inflammation, but one gram per day of the omega-3s reduced death, cardiovascular death, and sudden death by 20, 30, and 45% respectively. Diabetes, N3s reduce atherosclerosis in diabetics, and they help improve the blood flow throughout the rest of the circulation. And they actually reduce the triglycerides and the VLDL and HDL, which we talk about in another video. Here's one of the exciting things. It looks like fish, DHA, helped evolve human intelligence. Using isotopes, they, they can actually look at the bones and from the bone determine the type of diet that humans thousands, ten thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago consumed. The Neanderthal protein source was mainly wolves, large cats, felids, and hyenas. That was the source of their diet, whereas early modern humans we were more along the coast and we had a lot of fish in our diet. And we see that 40 to 50,000 years ago, the diet was 10 to 15% marine products. Seafood consumption coincided with the expansion of the human brain. As it grew, so was our seafood consumption. Brain tissue, astrocytes, these are little cells that surround the nerves and help nourish the nerves. And depending on the food that they get, LA, ALA, determines what they put out, arachidonic acid or DHA. So seafood consumption coincided with the expansion of the human brain. Brain tissue incubated with ALA will produce DHA, of course, and that's the energy source or that's the metabolite that cells need. And if it's incubated with LA, it forms arachidonic acid both of which are incorporated into the brain tissue. And that's okay, it's a good thing. So the brain itself, the gray matter, the outer part, is 40% lipids. The white matter is 50 to 70% lipids. The white matter is on the part on the inside, the gray matter is a part on the outside of the brain. And the fetal brain, the ratio of arachidonic acid to DHA in the brain of a fetus growing is one to one. It's a perfect ratio. Senior adult brain, and I'm saying this because the senior adult brain is a four to one ratio, a one to four ratio as far as N3 to N6, but the brain itself actually regulates how much is in there. It doesn't matter as much how much arachidonic acid or how much EPA or DHA is floating in the circulation on the outside. Inside the brain, it helps control the environment, and it wants a one to four ratio. 
the developing brain wants a one-to-one -one ratio. So again, they're both important. We need both, but in a one-to-one -one ratio or a one-to-four ratio, that's what the brain has decided that it needs, and that's what our body does its best to maintain. Vision. One of the largest sources of DHA in the body is inside the retina of the eye. 40% of all poly, the DHA is 40% of all the polyunsaturated fatty acids in the brain, 60% in the retina. Macular degeneration, something that as seniors we all get to deal with, where the inside of the eye along the retina, the macula, which has to do a lot with our color vision and detailed perception of what we see, it goes down. But the studies show that fatty fish helps lower the risk of developing it. There's a study, your eye study, of people over 65. Those people that ate fish at least once a week had 53% lower risk of AMD compared to the non-fish eaters. A study of 38,000 health care professionals showed that DHA and EPA at 330 milligrams had a 38% lower risk over the course of 10 years of developing AMD compared to people with a lower intake of DHA. Another clinical trial, however, showed that supplements had nothing to do with it. A study of supplements showed no benefit. Fish, not supplements. What about dry eye? Something we all suffer with as we get older. Well, if you look at a tear, you have the regular cells, then you have a little bit of mucus, you have water, and then a lipid layer, just like the cell membrane, to hold everything in. As we lose part of that lipid layer, the eyes become dry. So, of course, N3s can help that. 14% of the population has dry eye. As a study again, 32,000 women, 17% reduction in the highest levels of DHA intake compared to the lower levels of DHA. And the dry eye assessment and management study failed to show any benefit from supplements. It took fish. Alzheimer's disease. Well, again, DHA, important part of the brain. We've already talked about that. DHA helps prevent Alzheimer's disease. In fact, one study showed that the highest levels had a 60% highest levels of fish, 60% lower risk of dementia, and a 70% lower risk of Alzheimer's. Another study found a dose response curve for fish. Every 100 milligrams per day increase in DHA consumption corresponded to a 14% lower risk of dementia, 37% lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. And once more, supplements do not show the same effect as eating fish. Rheumatoid arthritis, symptomatic relief. But here you'll be glad to know, the supplements actually did help in rheumatoid arthritis and joint pain. So if you want to take supplements for joint pain, that's fine. Breast cancer, higher levels of omega-3 intake and supplemental omega-3, reduce breast cancer between 14 to 26%. However, the parent, the one I told you, which really is inactive, ALA, so if you increase ALA consumption in your diet, you are not lowering your risk of breast cancer. Colorectal cancer, same thing. Fish consumption lowered the risk of colon cancer. Prostate cancer, Inconsistent results. Some studies show a benefit. Other studies don't show a benefit. Other cancers, again, no consistent relationship on cancers with fish. Not only is it working itself, going out there and making changes, it also affects DNA and the way our bodies, our genetic code, produces other proteins that have effects in the body. So it affects the expression of proteins. And these proteins are involved in inflammation and lipid metabolism. EPA, the other one, we've been talking about DHA. EPA does produce inflammation or reduces inflammation. 
it can also lower the symptoms of depression, interesting enough. So linoleic acid. So that was the N3s, the omega-3s. Now we're going to talk about the N6s, omega-6. Linoleic acid is the most common. It's the parent fatty acid, as we mentioned before, that gets turned into or metabolized into arachidonic acid, GLA. Arachidonic acid makes icosanoids, just like the other ones, EPA and DHA and some of the others. And these icosanoids are actually the metabolic byproducts that cause the inflammation throughout the body and cause other problems. But look at this. Because of the oils, the increased oil consumption that we have, going back from 1909 to 1999, remember, 0.7 to 14.7, because of that, we went in 1960 to about 9% of our body. This is samples of body fat that they took and they analyzed. <clears throat> we went from about 9% to 8.5% all the way up to 25% today. We're getting way too much of linoleic acid. Don't worry about the metabolism down here, but the point is, is that the AA that we're getting, the arachidonic acid, it reacts with oxygen to cause stress. And that stress is pro-inflammatory, which the body then reacts to and is causing a lot of the disease and the chronic illness that we have because we're getting too much of a good thing. The metabolic product, GLA, that's another, let's look real quick, goes down to GLA right here before it converts over. And GLA is a good thing. It's anti-inflammatory in the body and it may help with the dry eye, rheumatoid arthritis and skin conditions. And it can work with DHA to treat other problems like blood pressure, it can help in asthma. So. Not everything from N6, linoleic acid, is bad. It can make arachidonic acid, very low rate. It makes GLA, which is a very positive thing in our body. But looking at arachidonic acid, it is involved in the cell membrane, but it makes those icosanoids that we talked about. And as doing it, COX-1, 2, 3, these are enzyme pathways in the body, they're making platelet aggregation, inflammation, atherosclerosis, joint destruction, and it interferes with cancer cell death. Meaning that the cancer cell, once it's started and going, this comes in and helps keep it from dying. It keeps it around longer for us. But like anything, not everything is bad, not everything is good. Arachidonic acid does have a role in the body as part of the membrane, as I mentioned. So it helps with the fluidity and the, the function of the cell membrane with the ion transports, the enzymes that float around in the membrane. It's necessary for neurotransmitters in the brain. We have to have arachidonic acid. Skeletal muscle. In fact, 17% of skeletal muscle is made of arachidonic acid. And it's also a supplement that you'll see sometimes that people are taking. Now, why they want to take poison, don't ask me. But arachidonic acid, is used by bodybuilders, and there's a whole lot of literature, if you Google it, of people using arachidonic acid, weightlifting to build up bigger muscles. I say, no, don't do it. CLA, the one that we talked about, that is made by the bacteria inside the, the cow. Again, it's an N6, it's an omega-6. And it does help, but where you see it now is that there's a lot of supplements out there with GLA where people think that it will help them lose weight and they're taking a ton of GLA for weight loss. It really doesn't. Maybe one or two pounds after 12 weeks, based on a lot of studies, it doesn't do that much. It really doesn't, and it's not worth taking. Summary of both N3, N6, omega parents, that's what they are. They're meant to produce the byproducts that we need. They're involved in our cells and the membranes and helping the function of the cells, but it really isn't the metabolically active source of N3, N6 in the body. So the main biological activity is going through the byproducts, the metabolites of it. DHA, EPA are anti-inflammatory, whereas ARA is involved in the skeletal muscle and nervous tissue, but is considered to be inflammatory, and we want less of it. LA and LA 
ALA compete for the same metabolic pathway. So if you raise one, you get less of the other. So the more linoleic acid that we get, and we saw how much more we're getting today than we used to get, that depresses the effect of ALA and the N3 omega-3 omega acids that we want. So EPA can block it, but we don't have a lot of EPA. We got more ARA. GLA is a N6 with anti-inflammatory properties. CLA is an N6 with anti-inflammatory properties that we get mainly from the cow with the bacterial fermentation inside the rumen. So now we get to the exciting part. We know what the omega-3s are. We know what the omega-6s are. We know where they come from. Plants for the parent, meat, eggs, dairy for the arachidonic acid, fish for DHA, EPA, so we know where they come from. We know the functions in the body, the omega-3s, primarily anti-inflammatory. Very important in our brain function, very important in proper vision. And we know that the omega-6s aren't all bad. They're not all bad. We have the GLA, we have CLA, and even the arachidonic acid has some important body functions. The problem is we got too much of it, way too much. So let's see how much we have. Here's something called the omega-3 index. They take the red blood cells, they look at the membrane. Remember, this is where all the amino acids, all the fatty acids go to is in the membrane. And they help out with membrane function. So they look at how much EPA and DHA is in the red blood cells. And that correlates to the amount that's in the brain, actually, and in heart tissue. So we have the index. EPA plus DHA in the red blood cells has a percent of the total membrane fatty acids, and it correlates with everything. And they actually put a number to it. So less than 4% of it, you had a high risk of heart disease. Between 4 and 8% is intermediate, over 8%, you're at a low risk of having heart disease and chronic disease problems. Well, where do we all fit in? Less than 4%, red, America, Canada, Brazil, India, even Italy, part of the Mediterranean region, they're, they're getting bad. Orange, 4 to 6%, or yellow, 6 to 8%, that intermediate area, again, good parts of it. Over 8%, where do we get it? We get it in Alaska, Eskimos, Greenland, Eskimos, Japan, Japanese, they love their fish. So, in the world, we're not getting enough omega-3. We've all become dominant and dependent on the grains. Another way of looking at it, that was the index, where we take EPA, DHA, and it's a percent of the red blood cell membrane. The ratio. Remember I showed you how much the linoleic acid has been going up? We're at 25% now of our body's fat compared to 9% to 8% where we should be. So we look at a ratio. How much omega-6 to omega-3 are we getting in our diet? It's critical for the balanced synthesis of the eicosanoids. Remember, nothing is all bad. It's just too much of something can be bad. So a high consumption of the plant oils, that's our problem. And a low consumption of marine, food, marine foods, N3. This is what increases that ratio. When we evolved, remember I told you the baby's brain is one to one? That the adult brain, because the body makes sure we get the right amount in there, is one to four? Well, when we evolved, we were one to one. That's what we were. Arachidonic acid, the DHA, EPA. We were one to one. The hunter gatherers, as we went out there and were gathering up foods and we hunted other animals, we were two to one to four to one. Beautiful ratio. Pre-industrial. Well, we started getting a little bit more oils, more grains. And I'm not saying grains are bad. We're gonna have a whole separate talk on grains. But we got more of it. And as we got more of it, our pre-industrial population was four to one to one to four. Big range. Still an okay range. We did okay. Japanese are the only people today with a proper balance of two to four to one. The Western diet, we're 10 to up to 50 to one on this ratio. And this is the problem. 
we are yin and our yang. So if we take the omega-3 index and the omega-3 ratio and we map them against each other, here's the index, the ratio, you can see there's pretty good correlation, which isn't all that surprising. And again, that 8% and higher that we want, that corresponds to a ratio of around four or less. The bad numbers over here, 4% and less, that's a ratio of 10 and higher. So again, you can measure either the ratio or the index. It's gonna give you the same basic information. The point is we're getting too much of the bad, not enough of the good. Okay, so how much should we be getting? And we'll concentrate really more with the omega-3s because we're getting plenty of the omega-6s. Well, there's a whole range. And in fact, if you look throughout the world, we see different recommendations. In a lot of countries, including the United States, we don't even have a recommendation. The only recommendation from the United States is two or more servings per week of fatty fish. That's about 250 milligrams per day. Well, if you look at globally, we're recommending about 500 milligrams of DHA, EPA, not ALA, not the alpha linolenic, DHA, EPA, 500 milligrams per day. If you have heart risk factors, high blood pressure, diabetes, overweight, physically inactive, it should be 700 to 1,000. And in fact, if you really have any type of heart problems, you should be over 1,000 milligrams, one gram daily with it. Russia has one of the highest recommendations. They recommend 1,300 milligrams a day of DHA EPA. France is at 500. Japan, they actually consume on average 1,300 milligrams a day. They have a lot of fish. And this is probably one of the reasons why the Japanese smoke a lot. Yet, they have very low heart disease because they're protected. What are the sources? Well, again, we want to reduce the amount of N6 that we're getting. So that's corn, grape seeds, safflower, sesame, sunflower oils. Pumpkin, sesame seeds, sunflower seeds are also very high in N6s. And we want to increase our omega-3s. Well, if you want to increase it through ALA, but remember, it has a very low conversion. In men, zero to four, probably 1%, women higher. But ALA comes in the seeds like chia, flax seeds, hemp seeds, the seeds that we like to put in instead of having fish. Walnuts are a great source. Walnuts is different than any other nut. Well, most of the nuts have a lot of monounsaturated fats. Walnuts have a lot of polyunsaturated fats. It's rich in omega-3s. Plant sources of EPA, DHA are actually sea vegetables, kelp, seaweed, and the microplankton that the fish eat. Fish do not make EPA, DHA. They eat it, and they eat it from the plankton. And that's really the main source of the omega-3s throughout the world. Linoleic requirements? Well, the amount to prevent deficiency, because remember, we do need it. It's not that it's all bad. We do need some. But the amount to prevent deficiencies is 1% to 2% of our calories. Uh, a study with infants showed 1.4% of your calories should be from that. Icaria that we showed earlier, 2% or less, but we don't need a whole lot. Definitely less than what we're getting. Here is a little table of the recommendations from various places, but again, it's all in the same ballpark. We, we should be getting 500 to 1,000 minimum. Japan is getting 1,300. Russia recommends 1,300 milligrams of DHA EPA and getting it as the ALA is not all that beneficial. So what about omega-3 fortification? This is a question I get quite a bit. You know, I'm always being asked about omega-3 eggs, omega-3 milk, um, bacon. Can I eat bacon that's fortified in omega-3? Well, let's take a look. Fortification, soybean oil is the largest source of omega-6. Farm animals are fed grain, which raises their omega-6, and farm-raised fish. 
remember fish, we think that it's all coming from the ocean. There's a lot of farm-raised fish too, and the farm-raised fish is fed grains, as well as ground up fish. And all of these things are doing something. What are they doing? Well, if we look at pasture, and this is the fatty acid content of the feed, of the food itself that we're feeding to the animals. If we look at pasture, the omega-3, omega-6, is much higher in grass, alfalfa, alfalfa hay. But what we're feeding our animals is corn, high oil corn, soybean meal, roasted soybeans, which are extremely high in omega-6. And they say, you are what you eat. So, what do we have? The grain-fed cattle, omega-6, omega-3, are extremely high in omega-6. As is grass-fed grass cattle, comes down quite a bit, antelope, deer, elk. But what I really want to point out, though, is that, and, and this is propaganda slide, is from Diaz Family Farm. They have grass-fed cows, and it has to be grass-fed, grass-finished. Just reading grass-fed doesn't mean anything. That means they're exposed to grass, but they're fattened up with grain, and what you actually wind up with is a omega-6 cow. So grass-fed means nothing. It's grass-fed, grass-finished. If it's not finished, you're not getting the benefits of it. So grass-fed, grass-finished, two to one ratio of six to three. That's great. That's a wonderful ratio. We've brought the omega-6s way down by getting rid of the grains and giving them what they're supposed to eat, grass. How does that compare? Well, they again did the analysis. These are two different types of feeds. And this feed is 12 to one, that feed is 17 to one. So grain fed, very high omega-6 in the animal. Grass fed, we're hitting to a normal ratio. Same thing with the milk. Well, remember the milk's coming from the cow. What they eat, what comes in, is what comes out. So conventional milk, a ratio of six to three of six to three is 5.77. Organic milk, we always think organic is great, and it is. It is much better. But organic milk is 2.28. Grass fed, grass finished. There's a brand called Grass Milk, actually, and you can find that in the local stores. We get it here. Is 0.95, basically a one-to-one -one ratio, a perfect ratio. It's a Wisconsin-based company. It's a co-op. Human milk is 4.8, just to put it in perspective, with the arachidonic to DHA, 0.7. LA to LA is 7.8. Pork, same thing. This is another um, promotion from another company, Arbuckles. So Arbuckle looked at grain-free. These are all his pigs. Grain-free, 50% grain, 100% grain. And I'm not sure what grain he's using. And you can see the ratios down here. Grain-free. 5, 10, 14 to 1 on his 100% grain. And then he went to the store and he bought pig at the store. That was 30 to 1. Now, I don't really know what the difference between the 100% grain and the store-bought is, but these are the numbers that he got that he put up. How about chickens? Well, same thing. They're fed grains. And in fact, a chicken, their gizzard, is meant more meant for grains than it is than for cows or sheep or, any, or ruminant type animals. However, normally they run free in the grass. They're eating bugs, they're eating worms. They do have some of the grass. They're not getting that when they're cooped up in a, in a farm. So, grain fed, beef, here's chicken. Way up on the omega-3 ratios. Chicken thigh, chicken breasts. IQ, this is a brand, this is a brand of chicken called IQ. So again, this is their propaganda. So omega-6, omega-3, they're what, about two to three to one, two to one, pasture raised, which is for chicken, probably the best you're gonna get raised out in the pasture. The problem is they're not eating just in the pasture, they're also supplementing their diet with grain to make sure that they get fat enough for us. So it's never 100%, but so pasture raised, nine to one, 
free range 19 to 1, conventional chickens 24 to 1 on the ratio. And again, what do we want? We want it to be 1 to 4 to 4 to 1, somewhere in that ratio, a 1 and a 4 in there either way. That's what we want. Ideally, 2 to 1. But when we're eating our chicken that you get regularly is 24 to 1. We think chicken is good. It's better than the beef, and that's a whole nother talk, but it's still bad unless you're getting pasture raised. Or if you find IQ, get IQ chicken. Another look at the chickens. Um, this one is from Slanker Select. So again, a ratio of 1.4 to 1 by taking care of the animal the way it's meant to be taken care of instead of force feeding it grain. On this study over here, he showed pastured chicken for 6, 3, the ratio. The ratio for the omega-3, 1.5. Pastured chicken, 8.5. Remember, I told you the pastured chicken is finished off with grain to bring up their weight. Free range, and free range doesn't mean they're out there. Free range means that the cage is open inside the barn and they're able to walk around inside the barn. They have access to go outside, low caged area, that they never do. 19.4 and the conventional chicken about 25. Again, just to let you know what these terms mean when you read it on an egg carton or when you go for your chicken. A conventional chicken is cooped up in a small cage. It can barely, it can't even lift its arms up. And it stays there, has no outdoor access. Hormones and antibiotics are given to it. The eggs are not very nutritional. Cage free, again, it just means they can walk around the barn pretty much. They really don't have any outdoor access. Typical chicken feed, common practice, free range. They have a little caged area. In fact, there's a show called Super Size Me 2. It's a follow-up from Super Size Me. And it goes into the chicken industry. And you'll be amazed and shocked, both. But free range, typical chicken feed, nothing different. They're going to be the same, the similar for the eggs. Certified organic. Well, they're raised the same as a regular chicken, certified organic. But the feed, the grain that they get is organic, meaning that it doesn't have hormones, no GMO, no insecticides, etc. But basically, it's the same as a regular chicken. Pasture raised is the only way you're going to get it. It's the most nutritious. Um, but again, they're finished off with grain, so you have to be careful. And it's a landmine. It really is. It's hard to tell good nutritionist food because they have lots of labels. So the omega-3 eggs, they're fed and raised conventionally, but the feed is supplemented. Conventional eggs, organic eggs, they're not treated with hormones, but essentially the same as conventional. Pasture eggs. Are they healthiest? They're allowed to roam free, but they do get commercial feed. So what about these labels that I mentioned a little bit about, especially labels, you know, because they can say anything they want. This, this was a beautiful study. Um, the, the guy went out, he got omega-3 eggs. He looked at the labels. Eggs from a diet free of animal fat. What's the ratio? 11.5. Organic, free range brown eggs. And first of all, it has not, brown has nothing to do with the feed or anything else. It's the strain of chicken. A type of chicken lays brown eggs, another type of chicken lays white eggs. That's all it is. So, organic, free-range brown eggs, almost 30 to 1. Made no difference that it's organic. It's just that it's organic grain. So what? Uncaged, unmedicated, and brown, 13 to 1. How about if it says... Cage-free, animal fat-free, 23 to 1. And these are all eggs grabbed at the local stores in his area with these labels. Naturally nested, uncaged, no steroids or stimulants, 39 to 1. These labels mean nothing. You cannot take any stock. You cannot believe in them. You cannot trust them. You have to find studies. And if they're not willing to put out their numbers... Don't buy them. Don't eat them. Pasture range is still supplemented with grains, and the specialty label is meaningless. The grass-fed difference. Well, meat and dairy from cows that are grain-fed 
are different than grass-fed and grass-finished. Grass-fed, grass-finished, grass-milk, pasture-raised chicken, and eggs. Now fish, because we've been talking about how good fish is. We have the same issue. If they're farm-raised, then they're going to have grain. You know, they have the big pond, they got to feed them. They're not out in the wild where they can eat what they should be eating, good plankton. They're fed grain. So, wild salmon versus farm salmon, just look at the color. The color alone will tell you everything you need to know. But look at here, omega-6, 341 for wild compared to almost 2,000 in the farmed animal. The omega-3, well, it's down a little bit, but so is that. So is the fat. If we look at the total fat, saturated fats, 1.9 compared to 6 on the farm, they get a lot more fat. That's why the omega-3 went up a little bit. But look how much more fat you're getting. Double the fat. And that's what you're seeing. These lines right here, all fat. You're not seeing the fat over here like you do there, the change in color. So we want wild cod fish not farm-raised. Now, some of the farm-raised, they are feeding it more and more fish itself, which will help build up the omega-3s in the fish if they're getting a fish-fed diet, but you have to watch for mercury and PCBs on those. Your best bet is wild-caught. So summary, poultry by pastured chicken. You don't know about the grain finishing. Eggs by pastured or omega-3 enriched eggs, if you're going to have the eggs. Red meat, grass-fed, grass-finished, milk, grass milk, or similar omega-3 milk. Fish by wild, not farmed. And there's a good little website, eatwild.com. You can go there, and it will show you in your community, your state, your area, areas that you can get grass-fed, grass-finished, pastured animals, eatwild.com. So the omega-3 animals have increased ALA. Here's our point. Increased ALA, not EPA and DHA. And remember, the conversion factor of ALA is minimal. So you're getting an animal, you're getting a product rich in omega-3s, and that's what they're talking about. That's what they're going to tell you. Rich in omega-3s. ALA is what it's rich in. And that's mainly an energy source. It has nothing to do with health. Nothing at all. It makes a bad product less bad because to get the increased ALA, we're decreasing our omega-6. That's a good thing. We're getting less omega-6, we're balancing the ratio, but we're balancing the ratio of the parents, not the active metabolic children. DHA is in fish, fish oils and krill oils. That's it. Fish, as I mentioned, do not make it themselves. They get it from the microalgae that they eat. And they consume the phytoplankton that consumes microalgae. And that is how it accumulates in their tissue. You can't get that in the farmed. So that's fortification, you know, trying to make the animal better, which does help by lowering the, the sixes. But we get threes that don't do us a lot of benefit, to be honest, but we are lowering the six. What about supplements? Because supplements, we're not going to get the parent. We're going to get the actual active metabolite. Doesn't that sound good? DHA, EPA, we can get that in a supplement. Well, a great idea. However, they do come with contaminants, carcinogen, non-carcinogen contaminants like mercury, heavy metals, antibiotics. They have odors, flavors, stability issues. I tell my patients not to have it. Why? Well, a 2017 review by the American Heart Association found no evidence, no evidence of benefit to prevent cardiovascular mortality, prevention of heart disease, prevention of stroke, or prevention of the atrial fibrillation. None. And remember when we we're talking about the N3s, I kept telling you about the heart disease and the diabetes, everything else, and the supplements didn't do anything. Fish helped, supplements didn't. Fish works, supplements don't. Now, we do have prescription supplements, ones that I really don't prescribe. And we have several flavors. Uh, Lavaza, which is mainly EPA with some DHA, a little bit of balance of both. Lacepa, which is pure EPA. 
and another one that has, again, the EPA, DHA. Well, they've done several studies on these also. And when it comes to cardiovascular disease, cancer, stroke, dementia, Alzheimer's, they don't do anything. The only thing, the only benefit we've found with any of them, and it's only one, this one right here with the EPA, is that it will reduce the triglycerides. And as a result of reducing the triglycerides, it lowered the cardiovascular risk a little bit. But that study where it lowered the cardiovascular risk was using it in people that had high triglycerides and they were already taking a statin medication. They didn't just give them the EPA and get results. They were on a statin medication and it wasn't just anybody. It was people on a statin medication taking, that had high triglycerides to begin with. If they didn't have high triglycerides, it didn't do anything. They're inconsistent. The ones that you buy over the counter are not regulated. And that's a big, big thing. I showed you on the prescription ones that are regulated and that you know you're getting a quality product. And even with them, we didn't always get good results. Well, the ones that you buy over the counter without a prescription, no good. This is what they say they have. This is what they do have. They're mislabeled. Over only three of 32 tested had the amount of EPA DHA that the label said it had. Only three of 32. They get oxidized. Oxidized is like your car is exposed to the sun and the paint turns whitish. That's oxidized. Well, this gets oxidized also. And how much? Well, half of 36 studied over the counter had a lot of oxidation. This is what a prescription one has. This is how much oxidation from dietary supplements. And they're not pure. You're, you don't know what you're getting. The composition of the dietary supplements vary immensely between products. The fish oil supplement has up to 50% of undisclosed whatever is in there. So supplements, again, the vital study, 2018 showed no benefit of one gram supplements in heart disease. The reduce it study in patients with elevated triglycerides did show a benefit, but that was four grams. That was a prescription one. You can't get that over the counter, a prescription one, in people with elevated triglycerides. So we want to reduce our omega-6 load. Stop cooking with seed oils. Olive oil really should be the only oil that you use. Fried foods, because they're frying it with the seed oils. So french fries, chips, packaged baked goods, junk food. Poultry and chicken, as we showed you, they're very high, very high in the omega-6s. So unfortunately, if you're trying to lower your omega-6, poultry is gone. We need to eat home-cooked meals because the restaurants are using soybean oil and other oils, but quite a bit of soybean oil. The DHA and EPA are the healthy omega-3s that you want, and they come from grass-fed, grass-finished, pastured animals, but it's not the real omega-3. It's just reducing your omega-6, and that's okay. We're reducing omega-6 that we get way too much of. We need to increase our omega-3, and not by supplements. I showed you supplements don't work, and not by fortified animals. I showed you it's only bringing in ALA, which does nothing but supply you with energy, calories. So we need to increase our omega-3s, fish at least twice weekly, and there's no upper limit. As we showed you in Russia, they recommend 1,300 milligrams. You need to have fish every day for that. Japanese are getting 1,300 milligrams. They eat fish almost every day. Green leafy vegetables, walnuts will give you omega-3. Again, if you eat beef, the grass-fed, when you buy fish, get oily fish, the smaller fish, not the big ones. And you can check out the website. I have a, a list right there of the, the better fishes that you can eat and that will give you the amount of omega-3s that you need. Well, this is the end of the omega-3s, and I hope that one day I can see you out in the community 
because I'm doing this right now, locked up basically, like everybody else. I'm staying home. I'm doing this in my garage. Nice echoes in here. Don't you love it? But one day soon, this will be over. And when it is, I want to be out there doing seminars. And I want to be able to meet you in person, shake your hand, and let's talk. Until then, stay healthy. I'm Dr. James Kreider.